Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. On behalf of USAID, Feed the Future, and AgriLinks, I welcome you to our webinar, Updating the Global Food Security Research Strategy, New Evidence and Opportunities. I am Michael Saltz with AgriLinks. Before we get, begin, let me orient you to the BlueJeans platform. On the right side of your screen, you'll see most of your controls. First, please use the chat to introduce yourself and network with colleagues from around the world. To ask questions, please use the Q&A button on the bottom right. Please indicate who the question is for. Feel free to upvote questions you want to be answered. You can ask questions throughout the webinar. Our Q&A session will be at the end of the webinar. If the presentation is too small on your screen, you can use the slide bar at the bottom of the window to adjust the view. Lastly, we are recording the webinar and will email you the post-event resources as soon as they are available. You can also find the resources at agrilinks.org when they are ready. Thank you for your attention. I will now pass it to USAID's Angela Records. Thank you, Michael. Uh, greetings, everyone. I'm Angela Records. I'm a science advisor in USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, and I'm the deputy lead for the Bureau's Research Community of Practice. And it's my great pleasure to introduce today's speakers, starting with Mike Mishner. Mr. Mishner currently serves as the Deputy Assistant Administrator in USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. In this role, he oversees the strategic direction and implementation of the agency's work on agriculture-led growth and the Bureau's efforts to engage and build partnerships with the private sector and research community in support of the US government's Global Hunger and Food Security Initiative, Feed the Future. Jamie Adams, Ms. Ms. Jamie Adams is Senior Advisor for International Affairs to the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Chief Scientist and the Undersecretary for Research, Education, and Economics. In this capacity, Ms. Adams engages in cross-functional international agricultural science and technology collaboration with all levels of staff and leadership from government and non-governmental organizations. She leads numerous international agricultural science and technology activities on behalf of the USDA Chief Scientist. Dr. Rob Bertram is the Chief Scientist in USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, where he serves as a key advisor on a range of technical and program issues to advance global food security and nutrition. In this role, he leads USAID's evidence-based efforts to advance research, technology, and implementation in support of Feed the Future. Dr. Keith Fugley is an economist with the USDA Economic Research Service, where he conducts research on the economics of technological change and science policy for agriculture. While with the federal government, Dr. Fugley has also worked with USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security and as a senior staff economist for the White House Council of Economic Advisors. Dr. Renee Lafitte is Deputy Director for Crops R&D in the Agricultural Development Group at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. She has a background in crop physiology, agronomy, and agroecology, with experience in technology discovery and product development for both intensive agriculture and resource-limited cropping systems. Dr. Shabani Ghosh is a public health nutritionist and research associate professor at the Friedman School of Nutrition, Science, and Policy within the Food and Nutrition Policy and Programs Division. She's also the Associate Director for the USAID Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Nutrition, with 20 years of experience working in the Middle East, South Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, Dr. Nora Lapitan is the lead for the Research Community of Practice in the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security at USAID. In this role, she oversees the Bureau's Feed the Future research portfolio. Dr. Lapitan also leads the Input Systems Division within the Center for Agriculture-Led Growth, which supports the development of innovations and technologies from agriculture research and the creation of delivery pathways for those innovations. And now I'd like to pass to um, Mike Mishner. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Uh, thank you so much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I know People from around the world are joining us today, and we are really excited to have these truly global perspectives help shape a revision of the Global Food Security Act research strategy. Um, I remember the first research strategy under Feed the Future that USAID and USDA co-developed when I was leading the Foreign Agricultural Service. It was so exciting to see Secretary Vil Vilsack's commitment back then 10 years ago, and I know it is just as strong today. 
In our discussions with Administrator Power, she is equally supportive of leveraging science and research to generate co-developed solutions with our partners across Africa, Asia, and the Americas. She was really impressed by our partnerships, including the scale we reached through a new and growing African seed sector that delivered drought-tolerant maize to 5 million African farm families growing the new seeds on nearly 13 million acres. When President Obama signed the Global Food Security Act in 2016, a first order of business was to develop a new research strategy to help achieve a vision of a world without hunger and where the scourges of child stunting and micronutrition deficiency were no more and where pro-poor growth helped people help themselves up from extreme poverty to better and fuller lives. All of these goals are still with us and we know the last few years have seen setbacks in some areas of the world compounded globally by COVID-19. So in some ways, our work now to achieve global food security is more compelling than ever, despite all the progress we have made. I know many of us were thrilled to hear President Biden's speech to the UN General Assembly when he resolutely raised this country's commitment to ending hunger and malnutrition at home and around the globe with $10 billion in funding. And then just days later, Secretary Vilsack and Administrator Power reiterated that commitment and the administrator added vision that recommits to achieving a 20% reduction in extreme poverty and child stunting in the areas where Feed the Future works. Achieving these measurable impacts requires focus and prioritization, and it also requires partnership. The same is true for the research that will be done to help drive these outcomes. We do have new tools. In every aspect of research, techniques and approaches are being refined and updated, sometimes opening up whole new research pathways. We also need to respond to the priorities that are emerging from the many consultations that have contributed to a refreshed global food security strategy. I think there are three aspects of the developing, of de of the developing new strategy that clearly point to research as a source of new technologies or practices. First, diversity, equity, and inclusion. With our focus on reducing extreme poverty and ending child stunting, Feed the Future has always been about equity, but that glass is half full. Particularly in the area of gender equity, we know that women's empowerment accelerates progress towards all of our objectives, poverty reduction, nutrition gains, and resilience. We need to ensure that our research takes this into account. And I know, for example, that gender is being built into the core of Innovation Lab and CGIR research. Youth is another key objective, and growth is a huge driver of youth inclusion. We see this across more sophisticated, knowledge-based value chains and market systems, like some of the exciting changes in service provisions that rely on digitally literate youth for success. The second big area for research to help advance the refresh strategy is the area of diet quality and diversity. This objective is exciting. It links what happens in fields and farms to making better food choices more accessible and affordable for poor populations in both rural and urban settings. It's also exciting because it's right at the heart of our poverty reduction and inclusion efforts, helping drive creation of jobs across these knowledge intensive systems that deliver safe, nutritious foods. While maintaining our focus on poverty and undernutrition, we can also help reduce some of the negative dietary transitions that are occurring. Last but far from least is the imperative posed by the climate crisis. Agriculture and food systems pose problems, but also offer solutions. And in many cases, those adaptive solutions also involve mitigation. The 2020 World Food Prize laureate Ratan Law brilliantly reminded us that we must keep agriculture and food, as well as environment and biodiversity, squarely in view as we meet the challenge of climate change. Science and research are absolutely essential to understand the trade-offs and the synergies as we rise to meet and solve simultaneously the climate, hunger, and global environmental challenges. That is ultimately the biggest research challenge we face in this decade, or perhaps even the last century. And we need our entire science establishment, universities, USDA, and the interagency, our international partners like CGIAR, and especially our public and private research partners around the world to come together to meet it. I hope that today is the first step in the development of a research strategy that meets this moment. And I look forward to staying closely engaged with you in delivering on that challenge. Special thanks to our guest speakers today, Jamie, Keith, Shivani, 
Renee, Rob, Nora, Angela, thank you for moderating. Um, I look, I know you're all going to have a fruitful dialogue to get today, and I look forward to seeing how it shapes our research strategy going forward. So now I'll hand it over to Jamie. Thank you everyone for your time this, today. Thanks so much, Mike, and it's so good to be working with you again, everyone. My name is Jamie Adams. I'm a senior advisor in the USDA Office of the Chief Scientist. The U.S. Department of Agriculture is so excited to be part of the U.S. government team led by USAID working on the global food security strategy refresh. USDA has a long history of working together with USAID and other U.S. partners on the global food security research strategy. I've had the pleasure of being involved in Feed the Future in one way or another since inception. Research has always been a part of Feed the Future, dating back to 2011, when the US government released the first global food security research strategy, which at that time complemented the Feed the Future guide. In 2017, the US government released the second global food security research strategy, and now we are excited to be working on the third. With each iteration, we have advanced the profile and the impact of research, a critical component of enabling the solutions tool set to accomplish our collective goal. Research is clearly distinguished in the Global Food Security Act, specifically calling for a whole of government strategy that harnesses science, technology, and innovation, including research and extension activities supported by the relevant federal departments and agencies, be the future innovation labs as well. Leveraging resources and expertise through partnerships and agricultural research and academic institutions and many others. Research figures prominently in the Feed the Future initiative because it is critical to sustainably enhancing agricultural productivity growth, which is strongly linked to economic growth in developing countries and has shown substantial impact on reducing poverty in Asia and Africa. Historically, while science, technology, and innovation has, have typically been highlighted in the global food security strategy, the research strategy has always been a separate document that's been released after. This all fits within the policy of the Biden administration to make evidence-based decisions guided by the best available science and data. Science and technological information, data, and evidence are central to the development and iterative improvement of sound policies and to the delivery of equitable programs across every area of government. We look forward to research being even more prominently connected with the global food security strategy in the future. This is great to see, and it resonates with the USDA approach. Research and science are critical to USDA's work. We have research-focused agencies, as you all know, but science and research aren't limited to just those agencies. Science and research spans the entirety of USDA. USDA investments provide a strong research environment that is available for Feed the Future programming to leverage and build upon. Working with the interagency, USDA provides opportunities for synergizing methods and data collection, which can improve comparisons among research groups. And when it's strategic, USDA researchers work with Feed the Future on topics of mutual benefit to Feed the Future host countries and to the United States. Finally, I'll note that the Global Food Security Strategy Refresh allows us to expand our work with the Feed the Future interagency within the US government, the interagency working group on research, which started in December of 2019 and supports the implementation of the strategy. Thank you so much for the opportunity to participate and to speak with you all today. I look forward to hearing from everyone throughout the meeting. And now it's my great pleasure to pass to my dear friend and colleague, Rob Bertram. Thanks so much, Jamie. And I have to say, I know I speak for all of us on the AID side of how much we value and enjoy and benefit from our partnership with USDA and leading the uh, research under the Global Food Security Act. So I think Let's go to the next slide, and I think uh, here it's good for us to step back and think about the context that we're doing this in. Um, I think, as Jamie said, science and technology were founding principles for Feed the Future, um, and I think that largely reflects the unique role of science in driving innovation in the agricultural and food sectors. Um, the other pieces that come together here in, in shaping our context is the fact that our country, the United States, has probably the world's largest capacities in both its public and private sectors. 
uh, we also have uh, that we can bring to bear, but we also have a tremendously diverse agriculture and food system in our country that can benefit from these international collaborations. So it's really leveraging all aspects of the agricultural community, research, but also private companies are interested, uh, producer organizations, all kinds of NGOs uh, and others that reflect the breadth of, of food and agriculture across America. Um, I think one of the things that stands out for me too is recognizing that our country is pretty much driven by an evidence-based approach in these matters. In other words, uh, politics doesn't enter into it too much. Uh, we can be very responsive to the, the interests and the demand expressed by our partner countries uh, around, around science, for example, in areas like biotechnology and gene editing, these new frontiers that are opening up. So that's a special role. I acknowledge the role of the Gates Foundation as a partner in that as well. But among bilateral donors, I think USAID stands out in this regard. Uh, we also have a, a tremendous support from Capitol Hill. Uh, the Congress actually provides a $150 million agricultural research directive in its funding provided to Feed the Future in, in 2021. And that uh, includes research, it includes policy and analysis, but it is, uh, I think, a signal of how highly these uh, investments are valued. Uh, the next slide, please. I want to say a bit about the partners that we work with uh, in general, and I hope many of you will see yourselves here uh, in one place or another. Uh, as mentioned by Jamie, we have the uh, innovation labs, our US university-led programs. Many of them do, in, first of all, they are founded on the cooperative research with our national partners in developing countries, but they also include uh, many uh, uh, USDA researchers, some researchers from private sector and other organizations. Uh, also the CGIR and the other multilaterally funded international centers like IFDC and the World Vegetable Center are critical partners to us and often link with the both the national research programs, the NARS, and also with our innovation labs that we fund. And then we have a broad uh, depth of research capacity in the United States that I mentioned. Uh, USDA most notably, but there's our state investments, other agencies that come together, uh, in, including through the interagency working group, that research working group that USDA and USAID co-chair. All of these efforts and the companies, and I also I want to mention the private companies in the US, all of these tie into our national programs and we seek wherever possible to sync with our mission funds overseas. The great bulk of Feed the Future resources are in our bilateral missions, investing in value chains, market systems, policies that are pro-investment. Uh, and, and, and so we try to take our improved uh, technologies, practices, policies, into those uh, partnerships in ways that strengthen them and uh, uh, ex expand the impact from these investments. Next slide, please. So a starting point for us is, as Jamie mentioned, the 2017 uh, Global Food Security Act research strategy. It had three high-level objectives. You can see them here. And they really reflect our poverty reduction, our resilience, and our, especially our nutrition goals, but also very importantly across our objectives, our gender equity goals and pro-poor economic opportunity, economic opportunity for poor people. And that's a, a huge part. And I know Keith's gonna say more about that when he speaks. And our task today and going forward over these coming months, working with you and, and people around the globe in the research community and in our part implementing partners in civil society and partner countries in international organizations uh, is to revise our Global Food Security Act research strategy to reflect the things that Mike talked about the, that are being elevated in the refreshed global food security strategy. Uh, next slide, please. So this begins with rigorous analysis of research priorities. As Mike said, we need to be focused to drive the kind of outcomes that administrator power is demanding from us in terms of child stunting reduction and extreme poverty reduction. So we need to think about which, where we invest, what crops, livestock, 
resource management practices or policies we invest in, uh, the uh, technologies, uh, a whole range of things where we try to understand both the potential looking forward from new things, but also the track record about what has really uh, uh, worked in the past. So it's a, it's a combination of keeping both those things in view. Uh, I, I wanted to call out an example of what we did with our colleagues in the Gates Foundation, Australia, uh, Germany, the UK uh, in, in recent years to come together around uh, working with the CGIAR system to refocus priorities by using analytic modeling and data to show where we could get the biggest bang for the buck on poverty reduction and on broad-based economic growth that, that, that it comes from. And, and that ended up shifting our investments uh, to, to roots and tubers and legumes more heavily in Africa. Cereals, of course, still really important, but we, you know, we're using it to try to, to hone our, our research agenda. Um, the second thing I'd say that is important to add here is uh, two things really. One is the recognition, the explicit recognition of national partners as integral to many of these efforts. I think that's something where all of us and all of our investments are continually going that direction and why we have to emphasize capacity building wherever we work uh, through collaborative research. And then the second thing that, that I wanted to add there is the metrics. You know, in the case of our crop improvement work, we're using really demanding metrics, uh, the gain, rate of gain in farmers' fields conditions, and two, the average uh, age-weighted area of varieties. In other words, really understanding, are we syncing up with the seed sector? Uh, are, we, are, we, are we giving them the products that allows farmers then to say, yes, I want that, and for her to make a new decision about planting a new variety that's more resistant to climate or docks or pests or diseases. Next, uh, next slide, please. And to do this, we're trying to learn. Uh, you know, the portfolio has uh, matured in many ways over 10 years, and we have uh, you know, a thousand innovations that have been developed. We're tracking those in ways to understand which are getting picked up and handed off to commercialization and scale through the private sector or public seed systems in some cases, depending on the crop, often a combination approach. Um, and, and so we have a, a research rack up tool that is allowing us to really understand that portfolio. We were pleased in looking at 130 technologies recently to see that 81% of them had been handed off and were starting to have an impact in farmers' fields. And, uh, but understanding these processes starts at the beginning of the research process. And that's where I wanted to call out our, our efforts to learn from the private sector around the world in how to develop products in ways that really respond to farmer demand, millers and bakers, consumers, really understanding that endpoint. And of course, that's not totally new, but we're continually upping our game. And I think by using explicitly the product lifecycle approach and very intentional laying out of impact pathways, we are upping our game overall to drive those impacts that Mike uh, spoke about in terms of really changing people's lives. So the final slide that I'd like to speak to is um, the issue of, of impact. And, and, and actually knowing what's happening. And we're really pleased to see a couple of new studies emerging. Some are just about to be published, but we're looking at really robust returns on investment in both our international multilateral investments that we make with other funders around the world, but also very much in our own innovation labs where, well, we also have joint partners there as well. I don't want to sell that short. Many of the labs are bringing in uh, uh, other partners besides USAID to help in their, their exciting work. But we've, uh, uh, Keith Fugley, who is our next speaker, has been involved in a study that uh, uh, suggests a really robust, um, I think, uh, something, a huge amount, more than 10 to 1, uh, 600, billion, uh, uh, 600 million investment, investment 8.3 billion in actual economic benefits. I think this kind of evidence is what Congress and ultimately American taxpayers and the whole community want from us. So keeping our eye on that prize, keeping that focus, understanding how we can better meet the new challenges Mike referred to, 
but also really uh, deliver on the commitment of the administrator. That's our challenge, and we're really excited to have all of our speakers here today and all of you uh, to be partners in this process. Let me stop there and turn it now to Keith Fugley from the Department of Agriculture's Economic Research Service. Thank you. Thanks, Rob, and uh, thanks to the organizers of this event for inviting me to participate. I would just like to take a few minutes to review what we have learned over the last five years on the role of agriculture in economic transformation. Uh, next slide, Liz. So by economic transformation, we really mean moving the economy from low income and low productive sectors and employment and really raising productivity and raising incomes and welfare across the whole economy. So it's really about ec you know, inclusive economic development. And one lesson, and this isn't really new, but new research has confirmed that this remains relevant for low and lower middle income countries today. And that is that raising agricultural productivity, especially amongst smallholder farmers, creates inclusive economic growth. So agricultural productivity growth is a big driver of poverty reduction. It raises incomes not only for farmers, but by creating uh, more abundant and lower cost food, uh, gener benefits the whole general population. Um, and this increase in incomes and uh, making food more affordable and frees up household income for other kinds of expenditures, this creates multipliers throughout the economy, especially uh, stimulates the non-farm sectors and, and, and generates demand for locally produced goods and services. And so we get from agricultural productivity growth, we get the stimulus to non-farm employment, especially in rural areas and small towns, and especially for low income workers. And so we have youth and landless laborers being able to find jobs uh, throughout the year in these new, uh, new sectors. And through these kinds of processes is how agriculture really drives poverty reduction. And new studies have shown that agricultural productivity re growth reduces poverty at two to four times the rate as comparable levels of growth in, in say manufacturing or service sectors in these low income countries. Another finding from recent research is that agricultural productivity also helps improve nutrition, really helps you know, our goals of, of really improving food security. And we see strong correlations between these income increases from productivity and reductions in child stunting in particular. And we also see, you know, higher incomes enabling households to move to a more diverse diet, including animal products and more fruits and vegetables, and moving away from just this sole reliance on a few starchy staples. However, uh, nutrition is a complex um, uh, goal, and productivity alone is not sufficient to address all of the dimensions of malnutrition. And here we find gender plays a big role in gender sensitive policies uh, to that improve women's access to education, their ability to earn income and hold access uh, assets and and to access both public and private services, you know, plays a very important role in improving family nutrition and health. And I think Shabani is going to have a lot more to say on this in her comments later this morning. Next slide, please. Another lesson is, you know, to get that productivity growing in agriculture really requires a robust and sustained investment in research and development. And this is not only at the international level, but really we need this local capacity, this national capacity uh, to, to adapt technologies to the local agroecologies and socioeconomic conditions of smallholder farmers so that they have something that's really useful for them that can raise their productivity that they can access. And as Rob mentioned, ag R&D is one of those investments that we find over and over again and new studies continue to confirm is a real high impact investment. And these returns to CGI research and to innovation labs, I mean, we should keep in mind that these are also high returns to national investments in, in uh, 
in agricultural research and development you know by our national partners because these are really joint investments these are joint outcomes uh, the CGIR the innovation labs working uh, collaboratively with national agricultural research systems and helping to build those national capacities and we continue to see you know that we get the highest returns in those technologies that can be widely and rapidly adopted and that means in addition to R&D investment to having this this enabling environment that can allow smallholder farmers to access technologies and also to access markets so that they have places where they can sell if you know if they when they start increasing uh, the the surplus that they can grow on their farms and so we have uh, in this little figure here you know different important elements of what this enabling environment consists of uh, a research and, and extension system that helps train and educate farmers about new practices and te technologies uh, market access and rural infrastructure rural roads there's another big high payoff area in many places because it really just you know lowers the costs of marketing significantly and allows farmers to both acquire fertilizers and other inputs at lower cost as well as sell their produce uh, macroeconomic stability and uh, agricultural price policies that at least you know um, maybe help stabilize markets but certainly help uh, don't tax agriculture that's been a problem in the past in many countries where price policies have tried to keep prices low for consumers that means also low for farmers and that's been a disincentive for farmers to you know and and expand their production and expand their productivity um, farming is also you know a risky business um, and uh, it's hard for farmers to often access capital and credit to make the investments necessary to to raise their productivity and outcome now Mike mentioned that some you know a, an interesting example a really important example of how sometimes you know stability can be built into technologies and he mentioned the case of drought resistant maize there's also been great success successes in South Asia with blood resistant rice and there's also other kinds of tools that farmers can use and and you know development programs can help provide to help farmers manage risks and therefore encourage more rapid adoption of new technology uh, next slide please so a third lesson is that um, most developing countries are well on the way to moving from a an agriculture that is dependent on resource expansion to one that really builds on productivity that is productivity and science led but that Africa continues to lag behind in that transition now Africa has made tremendous slides uh, strides over the last couple of decades in raising economic growth we have seen including agri including agricultural growth and we have seen you know lowering of poverty and and uh, malnutrition as a result but uh, much of that growth continues to simply you know rely on say expanding cropland and more workers on that cropland rather than raising the productivity of those resources and that's where this renewed and greater focus on an innovation strategy move to productivity led growth is really important and then uh, next slide Liz is um, that we do see cases in Africa of some countries really starting to make progress in moving toward this productivity led growth uh, through a national policies and strategies aimed at uh, you know really the zero down on uh, raising agricultural productivity one uh, really important and exciting case I think is Ethiopia where you know after several decades of political instability and conflict in the early 1990s it was able to establish uh, peace and uh, focused its development strategy on what it called agriculturally led industrialization so it built it in it, it doubled its spending on agricultural research and development it built Africa's largest uh, agricultural extension service it invested very heavily in rural roads to link uh, farmers to markets and it liberalized markets it said let's let prices drive resource allocation and signal resource allocation in the economy and reward farmers for their efforts and since the 1990s it's been able to sustain 
agricultural growth at over 5% per year. And a lot of that is, I mean, it, it's bringing more resources into production, but a lot of it is also through raising productivity of those resources. And that agricultural growth spurt has been associated with significant improvements in human welfare across the country, reduction in extreme poverty, uh, more than halving of child stunting rates, and reduction in the share of the population that faces food insecurity. So again, this is demonstrating how agricultural growth really contributes to this inclusive economic growth that improves human welfare. Uh, last slide, please, Liz. Uh, an, <clears throat> and that is another human, ex, uh, another, uh, I think, uh, emerging success story is Ghana. Now, this is a very different part of Africa. Ethiopia is, a, you know, highland East Africa, a cereal based system, and Ghana is the lowlands of West Africa. You have, you know, the forest zone in the south and the Guinea savannas in the north. And since the 1980s, after a uh, macro and political reforms were introduced into the country, as well as a more favorable environment for agriculture, Ghana has been able to sustain agricultural growth, again, at almost 5% per year. And especially over the last decade, we see that growth is really coming almost entirely from productivity now, rather than resource expansion. And in, and in particular, the growth, initially, I think a lot of it was taking place in the Cocoa Belt and the southern part of the country that has been more, more historically more commercially oriented. But in recent years, we've also seen that extend to northern Ghana, to the Guinea savanna, to the root and tuber crops and, and cereal-based part of the country. We see productivity growing in smallholder agriculture in, the, in, uh, in, in, in that part of the country. And we've seen, just in the last decade, halving of extreme poverty and child stunting uh, in northern Ghana. So Ghana, too, it increased investment in agricultural R&D, it invested in rural infrastructure, it liberalized agricultural markets, and it provided a more conducive environment for private sector investment in agriculture and agri-food uh, chains. And so we can see these examples showing that, yes, this strategy, when it's pursued aggressively and sustained in African countries, uh, can really lead to this agricultural-led, inclusive economic growth. Um, and these opportunities continue to, to exist. And I think I'm going to pass it now over to Renee, who's going to talk about some of the, some of the, uh, the research uh, opportunities in agriculture. Back to you, Renee. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Um, so uh, thank you to all of you who are listening. Uh, I'm delighted to come and talk to you about research approaches in a, in a changing climate. Um, I'm coming to you from the Gates Foundation, uh, where we're working on agricultural development. Uh, I particularly work in crops research and development. So I'm going to kind of do a little geeking out here um, the, um, to talk about the opportunities that exist with the vibrant um, agrotech uh, situation uh, ecology that we have right now. Um, but I want to give you some examples of how some of these new technologies enable new approaches. So I could go to the next slide, please. Um, so that was my introduction. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is what the climate challenge is for agriculture. And of course, it's twofold. Um, when we're working for smallholder farmers in, um, in Africa and South Asia, we're really concerned about climate adaptation. How do uh, farming practices change so that farmers can maintain their livelihoods and incomes and productivity levels in the face of climate change. But of course, agriculture produces a considerable quantity of the greenhouse gas emissions um, that are, are produced globally. And so we need to think about climate change mitigation um, as well. I just have one comment, uh, one slide on that. And then I'd like to summarize by talking about how we translate knowledge to impact. So could we go to the first slide, the next slide, please? Um, so it's, it's fairly obvious, but I did want to share this resource with you about how climate change affects agriculture. Um, this is a summary of literature, uh, that, of the refereed literature that talks about how each of these individual components, changes in precipitation, changes in temperature, and then the combination of the two 
how they actually land and impact agriculture. And you can see there's a large effect on changing growing seasons and growing zones. Um, there are changes on plant species distribution, and you can see the other changes, impact of extreme events, effects on crop yield directly, and then the biotic stressors such as pests and diseases. Um, this little inset at the bottom shows you the projected change in maize yields in Nigeria um, by 2050 as a result of these factors. And you can see a very negative situation where maize yields are expected to drop by 20 to 40 percent, uh, mainly as a result of re decreased rainfall in the north and increased temperatures in the south. So very significant changes in adaptation that needs to be made by farmers if the climate change continues at this rate into 2050. So we go to the next slide. So um, these are some of the crop research priorities that I'll talk about today. Um, but what I'm really trying to illustrate is not specific opportunities for investment uh, or specific research agendas, but some of the kind of more meta changes uh, uh, that would be needed to drive adaptation. So let's go to the next slide. Slide. Um, the, this slide I wanted to put up to, to think about just dreaming bigger and having higher aspirations. Um, the, the images here are looking at forecasting of uh, what will actually happen with weather generally over um, a season. Um, and this is associated with changes in ocean surface temperatures, those kinds of changes. And this can be used uh, in a crop monitoring sort of context to predict um, the warnings of production shortfalls and where we may have humanitarian crises. Um, what I think I'd like to use this slide to illustrate, though, is that um, we have opportunities to dream bigger. Problems of rainfall and, and temperature are obviously as old as, as agriculture, but we now have ability to do computation and algorithm division, um, development that, that should allow us to be much more granular in our predictions of rainfall and temperature Right now, we get pretty good predictions out to about seven days. A grower needs a sub-regional um, kind of prediction to know uh, what they should sow, what variety, um, and what operations uh, they would undertake. So one of the things we need to do is get to actionable predictions, uh, actionable at the level of the farm and decision maker uh, for climate and for weather. Um, another, another opportunity in front of us is in the next slide. And these two slides uh, I wanted to use to talk about one, some of the opportunities we have to work across disciplines. Um, the first is in the area of what I call phenotyping technology, simply uh, trying to analyze what happened to a crop in the field and how it responded. And here we have opportunities uh, with new technology coming in for environmental characterization, such as um, earth observation from satellites, in-field sensors, um, drone technology, robotic technology, um, and these can be used not necessarily at the level of the farm, but at the level of deciding uh, what, how to design products, um, crop improvement programs, and product placement as well. So we have opportunities to understand complexity uh, in ways that we didn't before because of new technologies. The next slide will also illustrate that joining of uh, disciplines to develop new opportunities. Um, this is, uh, I wanted to mention genomics combined with geographic information systems. This is used to um, allow the identification of novel genetic regions for crop improvement by bringing together these disciplines of, um, and technologies of whole genome sequencing um, and understanding what happened in individual locations historically um, to allow farmers over centuries to develop um, adapted genotypes. Um, so again, the merger of two fields, which are rather dispersed, um, you know, genome level uh, sequencing and the use of um, geographic information systems. Uh, in the next slide, I wanted to talk about um, other ways to apply technology. So in addition to discovering new alleles for crop improvement, we now are at a point where we can create new alleles. And this can be either through traditional transgenes or via gene editing, or even through synthetic biology, where we create entirely new pathways. Um, the focus I wanted, this is a very exciting area, but the focus I wanted to have today was to talk about how we needed to 
um, keep an eye on the actual product that you're trying to develop rather than simply um, delighting in the research uh, for its own sake. Um, so this is an area where really the sky is the limit in terms of what we can do with synthetic biology today. But we need to understand the trade-offs between stress tolerance and productivity. Um, we need to focus on crop life cycle changes uh, that farmers can use um, to develop, to use new products. Um, can we go on to the next slide? Oh, and I'm missing, uh, I'm missing an image here. Or perhaps could, you could do another click. Thank you. Uh, and another click. Um, this is a, thank you. Um, this is an example of how we can use um, research outputs to guide policy. And this is particularly around the use of uh, surveillance and um, uh, simulation-driven surveillance and early action for pests and diseases. And of course, we have a very current example of this in how the um, COVID pandemic is being uh, tracked and, and monitored in human populations. But we, uh, and we've seen other examples with locusts, for example, in the past couple of years. But the example that I'm showing you here is to illustrate how we can predict the spread of a disease, cassava brown streak disease, um, as we can predict how it may spread from 2020 to 2035 across Africa. Um, this prediction, uh, other than just making you feel depressed, uh, can be used to actually guide surveillance in a very cost-effective way. And it can be used to recommend action uh, by uh, local jurisdictions um, to, to monitor and control uh, this spread. So this is a case, much as uh, was discussed earlier, where we can use science evidence to guide policy and have impact. I go to the next slide, please. Um, here's another case where we need a new approach, uh, and this is around crop protection. And I put up this slide because I wanted to illustrate the need for public-private partnerships. And the earlier speakers have talked a little bit about this as well. Uh, in general, in North America, much of the crop protection innovation has been left in the private sector, um, but uh, and, and, and for, for good reasons, because of issues of regulation and the cost of deregulating or registering products. Um, but we have some new possibilities in front of us today, and I mentioned three of them there. Uh, one is the use of biologicals. Um, there's a lot of activity in industry to try and use microbes and fungi to control pests and diseases. Um, that's um, a little bit um, scattershot. Um, I think we need much better basic understanding and research to guide that understanding in order to focus better that kind of product development. Um, there's also, uh, and that, that may well come from the public sector. Uh, similarly with next generation chemistry, much more highly focused chemistry uh, with much uh, greater levels of safety um, and efficacy. And then finally, alternative approaches such as, as traps and, and life cycle disruption. Historically, this has been a very active area of research in the public sector, um, but it uh, has, has not been, it's not had the impact that it could have had. And I think here what we need is a real um, uh, partnership between the private sector and public sector uh, to try and address problems of crop protection. Um, this is important in the changing climate because with higher temperatures, we're going to see uh, more rapid development of pest uh, resistant pests and diseases, and also the movement of those pathogens and pests into to new geographies. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, and finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about changing agronomic practices. Of course, with agriculture, uh, we're trying to influence behavior at quite a granular scale, the, the scale of the individual decision maker. Uh, and so we need to think about um, extension, uh, how we can be much more efficient using technology, not only to um, define where there are technologies will be suitable, but also to get them out to, to farmers. And communications technology is, is spreading very, very rapidly and is really um, within a decade, I think that we'll see such widespread availability of communication uh, that we'll really be able to move recommendations faster. 
I wanted to mention also really quickly, uh, you know, soil health, uh, healthy root systems, uh, improved irrigation. These are all areas where we already know in many ways what we need to do, but making those technologies and approaches available to farmers um, and uh, so that they, they know what they can do in their farm uh, is the challenge. So this, this um, blend of social factors as well as technical factors uh, that is another ripe area for research and collaboration. Uh, can we go to the next slide? I did want to mention climate mitigation. Uh, as you're all aware, uh, agriculture produces somewhere between a quarter and a third of greenhouse gas emissions. And um, I'm not going to talk about the details of that here in this, in this limited time. Um, but I did want to highlight a couple of resources here if people are interested. There have been some very good quantitative studies looking at the sources of greenhouse gas emissions from uh, agriculture and also some of the predictions of how those will change in the future, particularly as uh, incomes improve and people use more livestock products in their diets. Um, so there's uh, almost half of those emissions come from livestock. And so there are real opportunities to think how we could uh, reduce um, in, enteric fermentation, the production of methane, uh, how we could manage fertilization to um, uh, soil fertilization to reduce uh, nitrous oxide emissions, and then, of course, how we can manage rice, uh, which is a big culprit, uh, again, through methane emissions. Uh, some, this uh, study on the right here talks about some of the actual costs uh, per gigaton of, of CO2 equivalents uh, of some of these different interventions. And so that's something we also can keep in mind. Again, another area for research. So in the last slide, um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about that, um, that pathway from innovation uh, that leads to technology, which is gradually de-risked uh, and then adopted. And that's what we need to do to get to impact, impact either on uh, farmer incomes and livelihoods through adaptation or impact actually on greenhouse uh, gas emissions. So while the challenge of weather variability is as old as agriculture, um, climate change is really increasing um, the, the urgency of addressing um, these, these research challenges. Um, we have a lot of experience and we have a very um, e exciting uh, technologies emerging. Um, but it's perhaps the novel collaborations um, across science, um, disciplines in science and also science actors um, and how we interface with the practitioners, with the farmers that present great new opportunities in this area. And it is this dynamic between basic science and applied research that drives this, um, that sparks innovation. Uh, and it seems that this research strategy is being um, refreshed and revised. There are great opportunities for this to, um, to have impact on farmers and on the climate. So thank you for uh, tolerating my uh, rather technical approach here. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Shivani Ghosh. Thank you, uh, Renee, and good morning, afternoon, and every uh, in evening, everyone. I'm Shivani Ghosh. I am at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts University. And my charge today is to talk uh, across this topic of diet quality, nutrition, and inclusion. Um, and if you would pass, uh, go to the next slide, please. Um, one of the questions, well, a series of questions came to my mind when I was having the conversation with Rob Bertram as to what is it that we want to say about this topic, particularly within the context of global nutrition. And the question then arises is who, who, who's included and who's not? And in a, in a sense, who are marginalized and what does it mean to be marginalized? And, and then the next thing is, what do we know about the diets and nutrition of these populations? And what are the actions to support or impede um, the diets and diet quality? And, and what are the opportunities within the context of this update that, um, that USAID is undertaking? So within this sort of rubric of questions, I have sort of laid out my next set of slides, and I'm hoping that uh, I'll, be, I'll be able to answer some of these questions, but maybe even pose them to the audience here who's, who've been posing some really good questions in the Q&A. Next slide, please. 
So all of you may be familiar with this, but this is work that has been done by Will Masters and colleagues at Harvard and Tufts and, and, and IFPRI around the affordability of a nutritious diet. And um, this is coming from the SOFI 2020. And essentially, from my perspective as a nutritionist, the marginalized are essentially those people who cannot afford a nutritious diet. And what you're seeing on the left side are the maps of, um, that were created for the SOFI report, where you can see the top map is where um, most of the world can actually access an energy sufficient diet where it, you, know, you can provide for advocate calories. What you're seeing is less, uh, less percentage of people in sub-Saharan Africa who can actually achieve a nutrient advocate diet. And then when you go to a healthy diet, which is where you want to be with respect to diversity of uh, food groups, where you want to account for um, climate issues, where you want to account for uh, healthy eating, you find that a lot of people are not able to meet those guidelines. So if you click on the next slide, next please. And, and this, the number is staggering. What um, Will and colleagues came up with in the 2017 data analysis was about 3 billion people which is 38% of the world population, cannot afford a healthy diet. And could you please click the next? Um, and yes, thank you. Um, uh, and what, what wasn't accounted for in that assessment was obviously COVID because this was done pre-COVID, but they have been doing work on, on the impacts of COVID and you find that there is going to be a rise in that number due to COVID-related income loss as well as there is going to be an increase related to price changes around these healthy foods. So from a nutrition angle and from the perspective of a nutritionist, I think that this is a huge issue, that these are the marginalized people that we are uh, looking at. But obviously that's a huge number. So within that, do we know who are the most vulnerable? And for that, I'll ask you to go to the next slide, please. So working within the space of maternal and infant nutrition, I think we will all agree that pregnant and lactating women and adolescent women who are often very young mothers are the most vulnerable subgroups. On the left side of the slide, what you're looking at is, again, from the SOFI report, what, you, what you're seeing is that the percentage of energy and iron requirements is the highest at a household level for this, these subgroups, that is pregnant and lactating women and adolescent women. Um, and it is not to sort of underestimate children under five or infants and young children, but within the context of a household and the total requirement in a household, that subgroup has the most need. And the table on the right, which essentially highlights the fact that, in fact, that population does not meet its own dietary needs, as illustrated by the diet diversity uh, percentage of women who have achieved diet diversity in three different countries. Um, and you see both in Asia and Africa that, in fact, rural populations, you find most women, half of the women don't actually meet their diet, dietary diversity. Uh, next slide, please. So what do we know about uh, then, what are the, what do we know about how diet quality or poor diet quality affects outcomes? And I'm going to specifically focus on birth outcomes, but that does translate into poor outcomes in early infancy and childhood. And then what are the actions that support um, either better diets or autonomy and agency and empowerment that translates into better nutrition? And how does household agricultural production and interactions with market probably either support or impede uh, healthy diets and a better nutrition? So this is what I'm going to focus on, and I'm going to be using examples from the research that has been conducted by many, many researchers across the Nutrition Innovation Lab from Tanzania to Uganda to Bangladesh to Nepal. So I'm going to start off with Tanzania, and I'll ask you to go to the next slide, please. So this is this is a study that was conducted by Isabel Mazzurera, who's a postdoctoral fellow in, uh, at, at Harvard School of Public Health. Um, and Isabel has been working with data from a large Tanzanian study on pregnant women. And one of her analysis was to look at the diet quality of women in pregnancy and its correlation and association with uh, adverse birth outcomes. And what she found was that uh, women with a higher diet quality had a, were much more protected from adverse birth outcomes. With the highest diet quality, uh, women with the highest diet quality having a 45% lower risk of preterm births and a 47% lower risk of low birth weight. 
And what you see, in, in, particularly in this population in Tanzania, this is from Dar es Salaam, 15% um, of the women in this population were actually gave birth, uh, had preterm birth. So this is a pre pretty significant finding uh, from Isabella and, and, um, and her, uh, her research team. Uh, next slide, please. Isabel also looked at from a perspective of agriculture and household production of specific nutrient-dense foods and assess how that affected uh, the diet uh, quality of the women in the household. And in this, she used also data from Tanzania, but from a, another study that was focused on um, 10 districts in eastern Tanzania. And what she found was households that had a high food crop diversity score, which is the total number of food crops that were produced, had, a, had women with a much higher, significantly higher diet quality score. Uh, in addition, if these women participated in wage or salaried employment, so which is essentially having agency and power and access to income for their own purposes, they had much better diet quality. Um, what was very interesting was uh, Isabel was able to look at market participation from two perspectives. Sorry, could you go back, please? Thank you. Um, and what she found was that if the household sold crops, then they, that had a negative relationship or association with the diet quality of the mother uh, or, or the woman of the household, uh, whereas if they actually purchased nutritious or uh, nutritious foods from the market, they had a better diet quality score. Similarly, distance to the markets uh, increased, uh, uh, increased a negative association with uh, diet quality. So this was sort of really highlighting the sort of nuanced relationship that diet diversity has with market participation, where if the household uh, is um, selling its nutrient-dense foods, it's it's not very supportive of a good diet, whereas if they are able to purchase nutrient-dense food, it is actually protective um, towards the woman's diet. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. And, and so when I was looking at the salaried employment and the sort of, you know, uh, uh, you, so as a metric of women's empowerment, I thought we should really look at what other researchers have done, and this is some data that is from Nasul Kabunga, who's one of our researchers in Uganda. Nasul was a postdoctoral fellow with the uh, Innovation Lab, and he is now with the government of Uganda supporting uh, generating rigorous data systems uh, for tracking agriculture and nutrition uh, investments in Uganda. Uh, and what Nasul, Nasul found was very interesting. Uh, first of all, he looked at what what is the potential for women to own cash crops within the context of Uganda, um, and what is, the, uh, what is the role of decision-making around cash crop and income generated around cash crops. And what he found that sole ownership, um, sole ownership by the woman of cash crops and sole decision-making was very positively associated with the height for age Z score of her child. Um, and then the joint decision making that the decisions that were made by the woman and the man around the use of the income around the cash crops was also associated uh, with uh, height for HC score. I thought that this was this was a very nice illustration of the importance of agency and autonomy uh, and empowerment of women within the context of access to um, agriculture. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and. We also find within the context of Asia, I'm sort of going over to Asia a little bit. Uh, this is a study that was done in Bangladesh where we assessed uh, within the Feed the Future Zone of Influence, uh, we had followed over 3,000 households over a year and a half and assessed the shift in diet quality in the women and examined it in relation to the type of engagement, the household, uh, the type of agriculture engagement. And specific interest was around aquaculture, horticulture engagement, because there were in USAID investments in that space uh, within the Feed the Future Zone of Influence. Um, and what, uh, what we found was uh, two things. One is households where there were, uh, where there was both aquaculture and horticulture engagement, women were more likely to achieve their diet quality. And this is illustrated in this graph on the right side, where you see the odds of having consumed fruits, dairy, fish uh, over the past 24 hours by the woman um, uh, was significantly higher when she belonged to a household that had both aquaculture and horticulture engagement. 
Um, and what was very interesting is that a follow that there was analysis also done of the nutrient value of the woman's diet. And this was done by Romana Akhtar, who is one of our researchers who's down in Bangladesh, who did her PhD on this. What she found was that the, the micronutrient value of the woman's diet was significantly better uh, when, when, when the woman belonged to a household that was engaged in both aquaculture and horticulture. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, so one of the things that we are seeing is that engagement in agriculture, and particularly agriculture that supports nutrient-dense crop production, that supports women's engagement, that supports her active participation within decision making does support diet, does support nutritional status, particularly of her children. But I wanted to sort of take a little bit of a flip and talk about the sort of negative elements of um, poor agricultural practices. And this is illustrated in the study that we conducted in Nepal called the Afla cohort study, where we followed pregnant women from the first uh, trimester through to their infants turning two years of age and we periodically assessed them for levels of aflatoxin. Uh, we assessed them at uh, uh, the birth outcomes in the women, and then we followed up on their children on every uh, on a three monthly basis. Um, but for this particular uh, presentation, I thought it was very important to illustrate uh, that when we were working in this area, our assumption was this is a predominantly rural population, and therefore there's going to be a huge reliance on uh, household production of specific commodities, particularly the ones that are, tend to be contaminated with aflatoxin. And what we found was exactly the opposite. So first of all, we did find a huge um, um, sort of, um, there was a huge and wide range of aflatoxin exposure um, in the women in these areas. And a lot of it was driven by groundnut and maize consumption. That's not surprising for many of you here are very familiar with these are the two major commodities that are contaminated with aflatoxin. And what, but what we found was diet diversity was not associated with uh, maternal aflatoxin levels and that we would expect that if there was a better diet quality, and they're less reliant on, uh, for instance, uh, maize or rice or groundnut consumption that they might actually have um, lower aflatoxins. That was not the case. What we also didn't find was any association of wealth or education. So aflatoxin contamination and exposure, if you will, was consistent across the entire uh, cohort of women irrespective of their status. What was one key finding that I really want to illustrate within the context of the interaction with markets is that most of the commodities that were associated with aflatoxin levels were actually sourced in the markets or there was some mixed sourcing happening in the case of corn. So peanuts and chilies, two major contaminated sources um, of afla, um, two major sources of aflatoxin in Nepal actually were sourced by this population in the in the markets. So in, in, in a sense, what we are seeing is that there is a, a you know, that agricultural production, particularly of nutrient dense cro uh, crops and foods, did support better diets in women. It does uh, support better nutrition, particularly when you have um, more empowered women. But there is also the fact that we need to understand not just the market interactions, but also the market interactions around food safety threats within the context of um, this uh, of Nepal. In the case of Uganda, it is very likely that agricultural practices at the household level are more um, are more related to aflatoxin exposure because of the, the mere fact that not a lot of dependence on markets exists in Uganda, particularly in certain contexts. Um, so, so in, in essence, this is essentially what we have been seeing within the context of diet quality and nutrition within, within, the, within the work that we have been doing across Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. And then the question arises then, so what next? What is it? What are the opportunities? Where, where should this go next in terms of uh, research um, that is going to be policy relevant and that's going to support programmatic action within the context of USAID investments? And for that, I'd like to go to the next slide, please. So we uh, at, at Tufts University, we had um, conducted a review of uh, food systems for nutrition review, and I had identified some, a series of different opportunities where one would really would be very interesting to focus uh, future research ideas. 
first of all, what we are seeing is that the uh, the food system is not just about agricultural production. There is there is an entire value chain post agricultural production. And there are obviously a lot of uh, innovation labs that are working in that space as well. So what we feel is that there is need for evidence of how interventions work across the food system to protect and promote diets and nutrition. And I'm going to add the term healthy diets. I think someone in the chat box mentioned about processed foods. I think the big, big concern is because healthy foods are not making it to the markets and or are not being produced and consumed, there is an influx of ultra processed and unhealthy foods that are becoming very accessible to women and children. So that's one thing. The second thing is that um, um, Rob mentioned about the research rack up. There are a lot of innovations and technologies that are that are the product of USAID investments. And I feel that assessing the scale up of those technologies or practices along the value chain is, is essential, but they should be really focused around nutrient dense foods and diets. Um, and and a, a lot of these assessments should really look at the diets of adolescent girls and women of reproductive age, as well as pregnant and lactating women. Because at the end of the day, those are really critical, critical, vulnerable subgroups within the context of marginalized populations. Um, finally, I don't think there is uh, any, any need to reiterate the importance of wash and hygiene and the food safety threats that a household, a community, and a system faces, and that we should be looking at research not just at the individual household level, but also at the community and at the systems level around these issues, because often a household might actually have really good practices let's say for aflatoxin mitigation, but it is in an environment where there are very poor practices around mitigation. Uh, and, and last but not the least, validation of metrics that are within the realm of ag production, foods, markets, and health. There are a, a series of new metrics that have emerged from all the work that has been going on in the nutrition and agriculture space. Um, and I think that validating these metrics so that they can be consistently used to track progress within this space is going to be uh, critical and is an opportunity for future research. Um, so thank you very much for uh, listening to me, and I'm going to pass it on over to Nora Lapitan. Great. Thank you so much, Bonnie. That's a really great talk. So first of all, I want to say that it's Great to see everyone here. I've been following the um, the chat who's on here. And um, thank you for staying on this long. And I hope you stay through the end of this session because this next part is really where we have the opportunity to do an, inter, inter, uh, an exchange to answer your questions. So first of all, I, I also want to mention that um, in terms of examples that uh, Renee have uh, presented in opportunities for science and technology to address uh, the issues and opportunities in, in climate change, many of the examples related to crops, I know she also presented um, some examples on, on livestock and fish and i just want to say that all of the issues around climate change relate not only to crops but all of the the commodities that we are uh, working on so that would include livestock and um and fish and um so the this next part really is just to say what do we do next so from today until uh october 14 we are going to continue receiving input from you and to provide comments uh, and your input, please uh, use the link that is in here, comments um, link down here in the, the last bullet. And we will consider all of your input as we draft the research strategy. Now, I want to say that there are so many questions. Thank you so much. The, those are excellent questions. We, we may not, mo most likely, we will not be able to get to all of them today. But please come back to the AgriLinks website. We will have responses for your questions. So um, in terms of timeline, uh, after the uh, consultation period, we will then start drafting. 
the research strategy. We, we should have a draft by early November, and this will be open for input by the U.S. government interagency. And then uh, this, in December, we will be finalizing the research strategy and ready for launching by January. So that's where I'll end and I'll uh, hand it over to Angela. Thank you so much, Nora, and all the presenters for excellent presentations. And to everyone who has been um, providing questions and comments in the chat box and the Q&A box, so uh, my strategy here is I'm going to focus mostly on the questions that got the most likes. And uh, so the first, um, and I'll ask the presenter or the presenters to um, maybe turn on their video when they, when they get a question. Uh, so the first thing is actually a, a statement um, more than a question. And so I'll read this and I think we'll address this one to Rob. Um, so the vast majority of smallholder farmers worldwide are extremely resource constrained. They usually cannot access most new technologies and innovations. The new strategy should be rooted in this reality and not continue to push out technologies that are not accessible. Rob, can you, um, I guess, reflect on that statement? Sure, thanks, Angela, and thanks for the, 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 the putting this issue on the table. But I don't think we want to push out anything. I hope I tried to convey that we're really trying to learn how to be demand-led, and that includes understanding what farmers want. Want. I, I'm not as pessimistic about the potential for technological change. We've seen it happen at scale through really important ways in many contexts, for example, in South Asia. Um, so, so, for example, uh, and in Ethiopia, Keith's slide, a lot of what we saw there was the adoption of fertilizers and the adoption of modern varieties of crops that were able to respond to improved agronomy. So what's, what happened in Ethiopia in the last 15 years, basically, I think, in fact, I read recently that the rate of agricultural growth there is, 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 is faster than it is in India at this point. So, and this is happening on smallholder farms across large areas of the country. And, it, and it's leading to the kinds of uh, agricultural structural transformation that other people have commented on. So I remain, you know, I, 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 we absolutely need to keep the eye on the prize of what is actually happening in farm fields or in pastures or in fish ponds or, or, or in fisheries. Uh, and, and, and that is, we're trying to build that into all of our research programs. But, uh, and the other point I'll make is the other huge thing that happened in South Asia, and it's starting to happen in Africa, was service provision, where small enterprises by a tractor, maybe a small tractor, uh, a hand managed tractor, two wheel, and do provision of land preparation or harvesting or threshing for communities that come together. And they, they uh, increase both their, uh, their um, market attractiveness to input suppliers, but also to output markets. So this is a way of spreading the risk on capitalization of what are essentially very poorly capitalized systems where they're not roads, there's not storage, there's not mechanization. So so it's trying to figure out the sweet spot to, to get over these risks that will help investments on farm and off respond to reduce the risks and then allow people to really grow their productivity, their incomes, and their options, the economic and uh, uh, livelihood options they have that occur when that starts to happen. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Rob. Uh, so the next question I'd like to pose for Keith, uh, and the question is, the vast majority of farmers in Africa will never, quote, farm themselves out of poverty. How can we help them improve productivity while diversifying increasingly out of farming? How can productive social protection be combined with an array of ag productivity investment to help rural households do this? Keith, can you respond to that one? Yeah, no, I think that's a that's a that's a very important point, um, and um, and that is part of what you know agricultural growth is designed to do is to create an economic transformation that allows many farmers to move out of agriculture. And often that, occur, uh, that occurs actually on a part-time basis. 
we find that one way that uh, growth occurs and that poverty reduction occurs and that this transformation occurs is that you know farmers uh, uh, gain uh, opportunities in the non-farm sector. So you find you know throughout even in our own country that many farmers are part-time farmers. Uh, they're 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 growing uh, um, food on their crops during the growing season and in the off season they're working in non-farm enterprises, non-farm jobs. Uh, some of those are related to agri-food value chains and some are completely outside in in, in services and construction and so forth. And it's stimul and what what constrains the non-farm sector in so many low-income countries is lack of income, lack of what we call it a demand side constraint. And that once you can start releasing that demand side constraint, once you start able to increase incomes of farm households and uh, reduce the share of expenditures that non-farm households have to spend on food, that means that they can demand more of these locally produced goods and services. And this is a tremendous growth multiplier that helps uh, uh, farm households obtain non-farm income and helps uh, move uh, farm population permanently in many cases into non-farm jobs. We often see this occurring uh, at a generational level. So, you know, youth who grew up on farms uh, are the first people often to move into these non-farm uh, employment opportunities. But what stimulates that is really this productivity in the economy that raises incomes. And productivity in agriculture tends to be, um, you know, really, and, you know, I think, you know, John Malore has written on this for decades and has had a great book on this a few years ago that how, shows how, how agricultural productivity and raising agricultural incomes uh, really generates this this transition to the non-farm sector. Thank you, Keith. And so this next question I'll direct to Nora, and this one got a lot of likes, and also there were some similar questions in the in the Q and A. Um, and this is around um, local researchers. Um, so the question is, will they be able to contribute to the research efforts, and will local institutions be able to access the research? They don't all need, quote, capacity building. They simply don't have access or aren't trusted by the U.S. Nora, I wonder if you could address the capacity building and access. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that question. So this is very similar to another question that I responded in the Q&A. And, uh, and, um, but this one also emphasized that there are needs is in, in terms of access, not just capacity building. And so, first of all, I want to say that as part of the research strategy, in fact, we have been putting this in place, is strengthening partnerships with between the, our um, U.S. researchers and the national partners, as well as the CG and national partners. And so, this is, uh, and, and this is strengthening the partnership throughout the R&D process, not just at some point where uh, materials to be tested, like improved crop varieties need to be tested in the field. So the, the model is changing for us. It's we want all of the partners to be involved from the very beginning. And this also is very much connected to what uh, Rob, uh, mentioned earlier, our focus on demand-led uh, research, because we understand that the, the needs in countries are understood by the national partners. So in terms of defining what the research questions are and what research outputs and products need to be developed, it needs to be uh, a collaborative process from the very beginning to the end. So that means that all of the research products will be accessible to the national partners. So um, that's it. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Nora. Uh, so the next question um, I'll pose to Rob. One of the U.S. commitments during the U.N. Food Systems Summit was a major investment in industrial fortification of food to improve nutrition. This is important 
what about improved crop and livestock system diversification as a key to improving diet diversity? How will the new research strategy address these issues? Rob? Thanks, Angela, and thanks, Julie Howard, for that question. Um, so I, at the, it's not either or. The large-scale fortification, which we are going to try to reinvigorate with our national partners and especially with the private sector, is, is, is one aspect of sort of a nutritional safety net. But the real prize, of course, is on affordable diet quality that Shabani talked about and I think that Mike talked about in his opening comments. And the, the great news there, Julie, I think you'll agree with this, is that by emphasizing more some of our opportunities in these higher value, more nutrient dense, also more food safety challenging, more knowledge intensive, more market sensitive, crops, livestock, uh, fruits and vegetables, fish, all of these kinds of products that are higher value, higher nutrition, higher uh, perishability and higher knowledge uh, are also great opportunities for poverty reduction. And what we need to do, I think one of our fundamental challenges is to help smallholders tap into growing demand in cities and towns, not just megacities, but towns all across the developing world where people have income led changes in their diets and we want them hopefully to have better choices. And in providing those choices, those safe, affordable, nutritious fruits, vegetables, dairy, eggs, fish, all kinds of uh, meat, uh, a whole, whole range of foods, we hope in doing that to really have growth and poverty reduction and nutrition improvement gains for the very poor and undernourished who are still concentrated in these large food producing areas in, in the rural parts, of, uh, rural parts of the developing world. So, so uh, absolutely, uh, I think we've got a win-win solution here. And a third win, I think that Mike mentioned or referred to, is that by making these quality foods more affordable, available, and safer, we can also help push back against negative dietary transitions that are occurring, especially in urban context, uh, associated consumption of less nutritious calories, sugars, and fats. So uh, I, I totally take the challenge, and I think that the diet quality emphasis that we're looking for and that Shivani spoke to and that the others I also referred to one way or another, even even Renee's talk about crops, a lot of the work on crops is ultimately also going to be about dietary improvement, whether it's through, uh, you know, better forages, uh, uh, soy for uh, nutritious foods, fish feeds. And that's that soy example, just on the previous question, we have seen 12,000 farmers in Mali basically start to move themselves out of poverty by growing soy and uh, selling to local uh, crushers that are providing both uh, cooking oil, but also uh, nutritious uh, animal feed for poultry, fish, et cetera. So we can see this happening even in some of the poorest countries in the world. Great, thanks so much, Rob. Uh, so the next question, um, this is a good segue to a question for Shabani around nutrient dense foods. So, uh, the question is, since maize is one of the key contributors to aflatoxin exposure in Nepal, does focusing on nutrient dense foods leave out key components of the food system negatively affecting nutrition, including food safety? Shabani, can you address that one? Uh, yes, I, I think I'm, I, so is the question moving away from maize consumption to more nutrient dense foods? Is that what the question is? I'm sorry, Angela. I, That's that's my understanding of it. Yeah, so, you know, I think in the case of Nepal, I would say that where we were, particularly the maize consumption was not very high. But as you go into the hills, um, there's a lot more maize consumption. Um, and, and then the question is, you know, I mean, I don't think it's a question. I think a work that has been done on seasonality and on what's available across the different ecological zones is that people are often relying on maize in the hills because of a lack of a diverse diet and access to fruits and vegetables and, and animal, animal source foods. 
Um, so yes, I think the idea is that we we really should be supporting a system that allows um, groups that are only relying on maize to have access to better um, uh, better diets. Um, so I don't know, Angela, if that answers the question. I think so. Thank you. Thanks so much, Shivani. Yeah. Or, uh, so um, I, we have a question. Of, we had several questions around social science, and I, I think I'll direct this one to Nora. The existing GFS re GFSS research strategy includes social science among the priorities. Would you speak to progress and ideas for strengthening multidisciplinary research moving forward, including a central focus on social science? So, Nora, I don't know if you if you have thoughts on that or or others. Yes. So, I, I will answer that in terms of the model that we are approaching in terms of designing products from research. So this really is a collaborative process and it takes into consideration all the, the the intended users of a product. So this means that we want to hear from not only the farmers, the, the agri-dealers, the millers and processors, but we want to take into consideration the, the gender issues so there will be part of that consultation will take a look at the the what women farmers would need for a particular um, for a particular uh, situation or a problem that we want to address through research and so th that would be one way that i would address that and also in the past we we've, we've really been using a uh, a number of assessments for example kansas state university has uh, looked at has developed a uh, sustainable sustainable intensification assessment framework that looks at the trade-offs of what happens in the adoption of a particular technology in terms of the economy and uh, the, the social impact. And so there are tools that we can use in, and, and intend to use as we design our uh, research investments. So, and I would welcome any other uh, speakers to address that. Um, I'm, I'm happy to just add that um, social science is something that we have in every single innovation lab and CGIR center. Uh, it, 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 it underlies understanding things like uh, decision making, women's time, community level uh, management of commons. There's so many issues that require this, and uh, in some of our innovation labs are are heavily uh, focused on social science in terms of understanding risk uh, profiles and, and uh, uh, opportunities for mitigating some of those. So I mean, the points are very well taken. It's an area where we're always looking to our research community partners. And I think of people like uh, Chris Bear, Brett, uh, uh, They have to come here because at the end of the day, one of the we need to have a, a, a vision of sustainability, and that requires integrating uh, equitable sustainability and and uh, environment and, and environmental sustainability. But it also means that's another thing I want to spend here is the challenge of the climate is business as usual is not going to succeed. And so I think as we without losing any of these core principles, we have got to look for ways to help people in their own lives. And just as Nora just said, we want to put the farmer first or the fisher or the uh, 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 livestock herder or whoever it happens to be. And, and, and work backwards from there and through them and their households and communities. So uh, social science, absolutely critical. Thank you, Rob. 
so, and actually, Rob, while I have you, I think I'll, I'll send a, a climate change question your way. So the question Great. is, how will the strategy consider climate change mitigation and adaptation more directly in the quest to reduce poverty and improve diet quality and diversity? And I'll note that there was another question related to food loss and waste and its significant contribution to greenhouse gas emissions. So perhaps you could just speak a bit on the climate change challenge. Okay, thank you. And I, uh, Renee had to leave otherwise because she did have, uh, I think you might have noticed at the end of her talk, she had a really nice rack up there about these mitigation and ad ad mitigation opportunities that also can be part of an environmentally sustainable poverty reduction nutrition enhancing objective. And some of those in the new uh, emerging global food security strategy, that those points are there about thinking more intentionally about uh, the uh, mitigation of climate change. I think the biggest prize for us is that so much of what we do around adaptation also involves mitigation. And um, it also involves, this was also a comment made, is resource management, using resources really wisely. So in, innovations around small farmer, small scale farmer led irrigation uh, offer great opportunities for um, making changes, allowing people to make changes that are really game changers from them. Maybe having a small garden all year long that they can sell and, and, and consume uh, high quality vegetables from, or maybe they can sustain a larger flock of goats or poultry. Um, all of these kinds of opportunities are there. Um, with respect to food loss and waste, um, in the developing context, traditionally, we have focused more on loss because waste is less of a, a, a large scale issue, although I'm sure in many urban settings it may be starting to grow as an issue in the developing world, and without a doubt. Um, but the losses are so large still, both pre pre-harvest and also post-harvest. And we do have, we are looking for, for ways to be, be more innovative in that space. Uh, technologies have been developed that help in make better decision-making on farm that also pay off in terms of aflatoxin control that uh, Shabani has mentioned. Um, I, I think that the focus on food loss will continue. I think it's going to get ratcheted up going forward because we're talking, remember we talked about the perishability of a lot of these nutrient dense foods and market and transport uh, uh, requirements are, uh, which are also job producing, are, are, are very attractive in many of them and the private sector is ready to step into those. So I think uh, keeping that in view in terms of value preservation, food safety preservation, nutrition quality preservation, those will loom larger as we uh, do more in these areas of uh, these uh, higher nutrient density, higher value food chains and market systems. Thank you so much, Rob. And thank you for taking a question that could have been directed to Renee. I know she had to leave early. Uh, so um, the next question, um, maybe Nora can address this one. Um, it's, it's a comment more than a question. Um, the, ways to better link research efforts. We still rely on third parties to adapt outputs of one team for inputs to the next in the impact pipeline. Can we be more explicit in specifying demand, for example, downstream researchers commissioning upstream research? And I know, Nora, you spoke about the, or you speak about the product life cycle, so perhaps that's related here. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the, that's, that's a great question. and. What we are um, looking to do differently now is to make sure that we are tracking the, the products that are in the different stages of development and that we are uh, looking forward in terms of what, which partners do we need to connect in order to make sure that there will be uh, that there will be entities who will pick up um, innovations developed from our research investments. So that is one of the uh, things that we are uh, 
really focusing on and changing as we move forward. So we're tracking the research innovations in the pipeline and making sure that we are connecting partners from uh, from the very beginning or where we need to make sure that there are uh, connections that need to be made. One of the other things that we also are, are um, going to look at is where our mission colleagues can really um, partner with us on. So when we know what the needs of different missions and countries are, and we have products that are being developed and we know which stages they are in the product life cycle, then we can begin socializing and uh, collaborating on um, strategies to bring in the missions and their implementing partners. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. Uh, so there's a, so I, um, I wanna kind of diversify the topics a bit. So there's a question around just digitalized agriculture. I wonder if any of the speakers have thoughts around um, you know, digitalization going forward. Keith or Rob, maybe. Well, I'll, I will jump in. Um, absolutely uh, is the answer. And I think this again, is something that's being adopted widely across the uh, uh, research community, both in the in our university-led program, CGIR, NARS, and someone, I think the key point here that got raised in one of the questions was the issue of information. And you know, when we talk about sustainable intensification, I've always thought that it's more about information than anything else, market information, information on pests and diseases, weather forecasts, all kinds of things that support uh, our, our other, other aspects of animal husbandry, uh, uh, fish uh, management or fishing fisheries management, that getting that information into the hands of farmers in ways that allow them to uh, uh, optimize its use is, is, it is integrated into many of the research programs we have. Uh, we, our bureau does have a digital uh, advisor, and I know the Gates Foundation has a team in this, and the CGIR system and, and others. So I think we're all scrambling to keep up with um, uh, the opportunities there. Uh, Renee pointed out that she thinks in 10 years, everybody will have this opportunity. I mean, already we see huge penetration of, of at least some kinds of, of cell phone coverage into all the areas we work in practically. But I think that's only going to grow. Uh, it also speaks to the role of the private sector as a conduit or the public sector in extension. This is, a, I'm pick that up, point, point up too. I think that's also come up in the chat. The importance of how we can convey uh, information about choices. I mean, this is all about trying to provide better choices to people all along the food system, but especially uh, the, 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 the farmers who are sort of the engine of the whole thing, if you will. Uh, so that that's another place where I think it's it's integral in achieving many of our efforts. Uh, things like pests and disease uh, resistance, of uh, uh, disease outbreaks of livestock, et cetera, uh, all of those uh, have applications for using digital tools in their management in terms of a, a means of identifying and, and mitigating, reducing risks. So I'll stop there. Keith or others, please, if you have comments on those, uh, or you yourself, Angela, uh, please feel free to, to, to join in on that. Well, the other thing that I would maybe add here that I think is very important um, in terms of what information technology can provide to agriculture generally is greater access to financial services. And this we see is really taking off even in you know many uh, rural areas in Africa where you know having a cell phone um, and having access to that sort of information technology allows a lot more people to, to have bank accounts to make uh, you know eases financial transactions makes access to credit easier, makes ability to save uh, easier. Now, 
a lot of this maybe is not uh, directly related to agricultural research. I mean, this is going on uh, and, it, and maybe is not an explicit part of a, of a research strategy, but it certainly is another way in which these technologies are changing the landscape uh, of agricultural development and in improving, in this case, access to, uh, to capital and financial services for smallholder farmers. Thanks so much, Rob and Keith, for your responses to that. Uh, so uh, there was a question around the research strategy, how the research strategy will place emphasis on improving the affordability of healthy diets and not only energy rich diets. We've touched on this a bit, but I wanted to see if anyone had any further thoughts on um, you know, healthy versus en energy rich diets. I don't know if that's a question for Shabani or Rob. Maybe I can sort of, I can't speak from it from the strategy perspective, but I think from a sort of being a researcher in this space, I can say that, you know, the, uh, you know, there is need for both uh, achieving energy needs, but those energy needs need to be nutrient dense. I think that's the first thing. So if it, so there is going to have to be a, um, a you know, there, there's going to have to be this sort of balance between productivity and income from Stable crops and uh, and the need for introducing nutrient dense uh, foods. Um, I think the one the other thing I'd like to mention is that often it's not so much of the production of nutrient dense food; it's actually getting access to the already available but not accessible foods. Right? I think there's been some comments in the in the in the Q and A about infrastructure of markets. Uh, food loss and food waste is a huge issue for fruits, vegetables, animal source foods. And I think that that part uh, is something that is being tackled by innovation labs, and I hope it's going to continue to be tackled within the context of the new strategy. So two things: one is, you know, energy needs are there; they are not going to go away. But yes, you shouldn't be prioritizing them over nutrient density. But I think there has to be a balance. Uh, if if I could uh, weigh in on this question too, I mean, this comes up all the time in discussion, and I think. I think we need to keep in mind that um, you know making nutrient dense foods more available and more affordable is not just about uh, you know focusing more research on those types of foods, but that uh, research on staple food crops also contributes to it. Uh, and the way that this works is, I mean, what what you know the work you know Will Masters and everyone has shown very clearly that affordability is a big problem. Low incomes uh, mean that you can't afford uh, things like meat and eggs. And, um, and uh, you know, farmers who produce um, uh, crops with very low productivity simply don't make that kind of income to afford them. So what happens in, uh, in, uh, in an agricultural system where, you know, you can get technologies that can raise productivity of what we call our energy foods, it doesn't necessarily lead to more consumption of those foods. In fact, what we find is consistently is that as incomes rise, uh, farmers and consumers, you know, diversify their diets into more energy and, uh, excuse me, into more uh, nutrient dense foods when they can afford them. So, uh, you know, and we've seen this in our own country is that, uh, you know, or, or in Asia, if you look at, you know, per capita rice consumption, has been is going down as incomes rise, and what happens is you know consumers then use those in that increases in income to diversify their diets, buy more animal products, fruits and vegetables, beans and so forth. And so research on energy foods um, uh, that can really go to scale, uh, raise incomes, and also importantly, what happens then is as consumption of those commodities uh, declines on a per capita basis, more and more of those commodities then go into animal production to make um, meat and milk and eggs uh, cheaper, you know, because, you know, the, the feed requirements uh, make up 60 to 70 percent of the cost of those foods. And so if those, um, enter, if the feed is cheaper, then, you know, those meat and milk and eggs also become cheaper. So investing in energy, uh, 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 staple crops continues to be a major 
uh, should, I think, continue to be a major priority because it will raise incomes and make uh, these uh, more diverse products more affordable. May I just add a quick comment there, uh, Angela, and that is that Keith puts his finger on a really important point. I just want to mention that conversely, if staple prices rise, we see diet deterioration and child nutrition outcome deterioration because people lose the ability to buy an egg, fish, fruits and vegetables, and other high quality nutrient dense foods. So we need, we so in addition to the connections Keith mentioned, there is also that affordability, affordability issue that actually uh, uh, helps uh, incentivize dietary diversification. We've seen this beginning with Martin Blom's work back in the 90s, but multiple times since then. And I believe in, during COVID, we were able to see the impacts of either price rises for uh, nutrient dense foods or price rises for uh, uh, staple foods having uh, a deleterious effect on dietary quality for low income people and subsequent nutrition outcomes, especially for children. Thank you, Rob. And Shivani, do you, do you want to add to that? Yes, if you don't mind, I think I just wanted to sort of uh, also address one of the comments that just came in about um, encouraging more meat and milk products. Isn't this a climate issue? I think it's sort of this, yeah, this is very complex and very nuanced. You know, you want to make sure that there is increased income and productivity that then drives nutrient dense diets. And then the question is, if you're driving nutrient dense diets, this is not just about uh, meat and milk, it's about providing meat and milk that are sourced and produced in a sustainable manner. We haven't talked a lot about that, but that is pretty much the underlying assumption here. The second thing is that fruits and vegetables are the other part of the nutrient dense diet, which not many people consume. And yes, it's a function of access and availability, but often be, it's a, it's a behavior related, a practice related issue that not a lot of people don't like vegetables in the world. I don't know why, but they don't like vegetables. Um, so I think the, the point here to be made is that nutrient dense diets should not have to come at the expense of the climate and they shouldn't have to come at the expense of uh, of um, productivity and growth. I think these all have to go hand in hand. It does make the situation more complex and more nuanced, which is why all of us as the community have to work together. Back to you, Angela. Thank you, Shivani, and others who, who responded from the panel on that question. And I think this next question I'll put out to the panel as well. Um, and this is around policy. So food policies are being called to address multiple objectives, nutrition, income, climate, youth. This requires packages of policy instruments and monitoring to ensure that there is an enabling environment for multiple positive outcomes. I just wonder if Rob or others could speak to um, how policy fits into the new strategy. I'm happy to do that, but let me, could we start with Keith on this one just to, because it's such a critical lever for economic, uh, for behavior. I'm just curious, Keith, if you wanted to make any general comment and then I can pick up on, on how we're trying to approach it in strategy. Well, you know, I guess um, I might just focus um, some, a few remarks on, you know, the very important role that policy plays in terms of stimulating uh, broader, you know, sort of this inclusive agricultural productivity growth. And um, policy uh, has uh, been um, both the friend and foe of agriculture. Um, in, and um, so, you know, and, it, and in many cases, it, is, it, is provide, it has been a big constraint to uh, incentivizing uh, rapid growth in agriculture. And this was particularly true uh, in you know the 60s and 70s and 80s, when uh, a lot of uh, agri a lot of countries followed policies that effectively taxed agriculture uh, to try to you know keep food prices low for consumers, but as a result you know really um, 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 disincentivized growth in agriculture and and really uh, you know provided very few incentives to invest in productivity or or, or growth. And one, one of the things that I think has really changed over the last couple of decades is a better macro policy environment, particularly in African countries where uh, you have, you know, more realistic exchange rates, you have more market orientation to uh, commodity markets, 
and this has um, really uh, stimulated a lot of growth in the agricultural sector. But as I mentioned, you know, a lot of this growth is still sort of, you know, land dependent, resource dependent, and uh, the the key I think that a lot of countries face now is to orient policies toward getting this more innovation strategy, uh, investing in building capacity and research and development, finding uh, more stable ways of you know, financing research and development and extension services, as well as related services you know, to really encourage the rapid uh, improvement in productivity in, in agriculture. So I'll add to that then, uh, thanks Keith, in saying that the questioner is, or the commenter is correct, that the asks of policy keep expanding. <coughs> Excuse me. So now we have for, have, for example, climate change, where policy and governance are going to have a significant role. We have nutrition, where people are looking to policy to also shape food systems that deliver safe, nutritious, and affordable foods. Uh, I think Feed the Future, not since its beginning, but since about a year after it began, has recognized that policy, along with technology, information, these, uh, these other uh, uh, change, uh, information about better practices and innovation, let's say, that those three things have to come together. And uh, that, so there has been a big effort to up our game on policy. Uh, a, a lot of the innovation labs lead in this space, so do the CGIR, but most importantly, our, our counterparts, especially in Africa and Asia, uh, uh, lead uh, through regional economic opportunities uh, in growing numbers of, uh, of uh, uh, African-led, for example, like Academia 2063 or uh, in Opry down in, in, in Zambia. These, these are sources of that policy uh, leadership coming from the African continent and ultimately from the AU as well. Um, I think the other point that I'd like to put out there that is still a real challenge for us is the distinction between policy formulation and good policy, things that like transparency and predictability that reduce investment risk on on farm, in food systems, in marketing and processing and trade, uh, juxtaposed with policy implementation. We see a big gap there and we're still struggling with that. We've seen huge improvements in trade. For example, regional trade has been a huge benefit, I think, to, to, to foods, food security and resilience across many parts of Africa. But policy implementation on the ground, the, the burden of uh, uh, a truck being stopped 12 times in 300 kilometers, uh, just the time and expense associated with that can be real uh, a real burden to system-wide efficiency and growth that really meets the needs of low-income people. Thank you so much, Rob and um, Keith. So I think we have about three minutes remaining. Um, I just wanted to, uh, before we before we break break away, I wanted to make sure that folks um, are reminded that there's an opportunity for further comment. Um, so we're, we're uh, collecting the questions and um, comments that have come in during this AgriLinks event. Um, and we will, as Nora mentioned, uh, endeavor to answer any questions that we didn't um, raise in the discussion today. Um, and then we'll also, there will be an, uh, of an avenue for you to provide further comment over the next week. So through October 14th, um, if you register with AgriLinks to be a registered user, you'll have the opportunity to provide comments on the, the event page, the page for this event. So um, please do provide your input. And, um, and then as we, as Nora noted, um, we're expecting a draft of the new um, research strategy sometime in early November and a launch hopefully in January. So um, with that, I want to just thank everyone for your contributions and um, we look forward to um, working with everyone in the future. Have a great day.